Thank you very much, Antonio. I also don't want to miss the opportunity to thank the organizers, to sp thank especially Viviana, to thank you, Antonino, Enrico from Ebri, having proposed me certainly to give this talk here, and to everyone else who has made this, this, this event something very, very special, the beautiful music, music that you have heard. And of course, I'm very, very honored to speak on this occasion, also thinking of Rita Levi of Montalcini, who I actually once met um, in the Vatican, and and was very impressed by her. I read her biography, the first one that she wrote, and I was very impressed by the passion with which she wrote about her work. Now, she was somebody who was not only a great scientist, she could cook very well, she was interested in music, she was interested in art, and we learn all that in, in her biography. So I will take you on a journey, and I must say that the speakers who were talking before, in, just, just today, Actually, all of them have some bearing on what I have to tell you now. So all the talks have been beautiful introductions to my work. So the scientific part, which I will present, has actually nothing to do with the work from my lab and you know, work from great people who I'm sure they follow the talk now in the lab. Um, but I actually try to unite some ideas forwarded by others and make a very brief summary, a little bit bearing on the first talk, and then I want to do to together with you a text analysis on three or maybe four paragraphs from Marcel Proust in which you will find united all these components that you have heard about today. You will hear here how emotions are very influential on memory formation. You will hear how memory on the opposite, they Inf how, how memory influences emotions and vice versa. You will hear the importance of the reward system and something that we did not touch so much upon today. You will hear the importance of cognition in generating pleasure, which I find very, very interesting. Um, and I want to go with you through these texts. So let me begin. Yeah, so we heard uh, about Memosine already from Lina on the last talk, and she pointed out already um, how important memory is and this direct connection between Memosine, the goddess of memory, and the muses. So memory and creativity. Now, we also heard from Lina just in this very last talk about the Ars Memoria and how going back to Greek tradition, memory is spatialized and how we can use the Ars Memoria to enhance our memories, how this technique has been used over centuries and how it changed and how we, and, and the fruition it brought also in art and Dante was the best example. So here you find also in my talk a few examples how difficult texts were memorized by putting them in a particular location that is known to you. This can be part of your body as here the hand, but also music can be memorized in this fashion. And here you have other examples. This is from an incunable that is in Karlsruhe in Germany where a very a lengthy prayer is also broken up in parts and put on the different members, on the different parts of your, of your digits. And of course, you would say the, this prayer for, uh, for, uh, for, you know, to, to get benediction to, to uh, uh, and, and again, this, this was a source to help you memorize these difficult talks. Now, there are also other ones. Ladders are often used to spatialize something that you want to memorize. And again, we heard from Lina, which of course I did not know she would show that one of the most beautiful examples is Botticelli's Inferno that I hope that I will see on Saturday in this exhibition um, shown here in, in Rome. So to put things or to have them in a certain location helps you memorize, it helps you um, record your memories better. Now we move into the scientific part very, very quickly. And here too, we heard in the first talk this morning, you know, how our brain will change, how if you remember something of what you've heard today, tomorrow something has changed in your brain. And it can change at different levels. It changes physically, actually. And we know this ever, ever since your great Golgi produced, you know, or developed the technique of the Golgi silver impregnation technique. And we could visualize these individual neurons in the brain, these workers that help us generate memories. And this would be one neuron and it's dendrite. So this is the structure where a neuron receives all the information and it 
in the magnification, you see these little spines where most of the receptors are located. Now, if for instance, you were to see the brain or uh, itself from an Alzheimer patient, all these spines are gone. So here you have many, many, many receptors which actually help the neurons to talk to each other. Now, you see here in this particular slide, two filled neurons, so said this is in the hippocampus, the structure that I will talk about later, and you see this one neuron and its cell body, and the output of the neuron is one axon. So if you look at the ramification of these axons, a neuron neuron would make, in, on average, about 10,000, 20,000 synapses with other neurons, so you can imagine the complexity that we have when it is about communication of neurons in the brain. Now, in this animation, you will see what happens when neurons talk to each other, and it bears on what I have to say afterwards with the Proust, on, on the Proust text. If a, the, we, we have an enlarged synapse where a neurotransmitter is released, so this is the ending coming from a particular neuron far away, and when the neurotransmitter is being released, it opens in the next cell in the, at the synapse particular types of um, receptors, and you can measure an electrical signal. So I hope that this works. Okay, so when the neurotransmitter is being released, and, uh, the receptors are activated, and in the lab, we can measure the, the strength of the signal, we can measure the amplitude of this signal. Now what happens if a cell is repetitively stimulated? In that case, other receptors open up, and it is particular this NMDA receptor that I worked on when I was young. We cloned it in the lab of Peter Siebert. This receptor is normally silent, but upon repetitive stimulation, it opens up. And what happens now, if hours later, the cell is stimulated again, this synaptic current is larger. Now, I cannot talk about the different mechanisms, and we heard in the first talk how this larger current can be generated. You can have either more neurotransmitter being released, you, they can, the cell can modify the existing neurotransmitters, or what the cell can also do, it can put a new transmitter into the synapse so that the signal stays larger for a longer time. So we are interested in that, what we is called plasticity, and when we learn, this is what happens in our brain brain, and I am very particularly interested, um, as Christina this morning, in this structure that we now have heard about uh, quite a bit, the hippocampus. Now, the hippocampus is important for learning and memory, and for that type of memory that Christina has introduced to us that we call episodic memory. That is a memory that has to deal with what happened, where, and when. And I will now show you, and we will see it also later, that the hippocampus is absolutely essential for generating this memory. And the hippocampus is very, very important for, for, giving this, for, for generating cognitive maps and for giving us this map in which we move basically in time and in space. Now, but I want to point out already at this moment that when we speak about the memories, the hippocampus is important to generate these memories, but we heard already in all the other talks that other systems are involved. We heard about the amygdala that is important for, for, for the generation, the maintenance of emotions, for the recall of emotions, and the amygdala talks directly uh, with the hippocampus. We will actually hear later about the frontal cortex that is important for cognition. We heard about the striatum, not shown here, it is deep in the brain, that is very, very important for the reward system. And all these systems get activated when we experience or when we recall strong um, uh, memories. Now, in the lab, we can record from individual cells. There are different techniques, but what I want to show you is whenever you see such a blip in such a trace, like here, there is a spike that the cell is active, and today, with modern measures, you can see when I move from A to B, which cell is active, for instance. Of course, we do not do that in humans. We also work with animal models, but in our brain, it would not look different, and we are absolutely sure that what we learn from the animal models can be translated directly to the human, so we can see which cell is active in which context under which circumstances. Now, this is a slice that is very, very important to me and that brings me back to, this, to, this, to the last talk. 
The hippocampus is important to generate the spatial map because, as O'Keefe and the Mozarts have shown, and they obtained the Nobel Prize for that, in the hippocampus and its adjacent structures, there are cells that are called place cells or grid cells or head direction cells or border cells. So we have a GPS system in this structure, and as shown here, if the animal runs in this particular space, in gray you see the trajectory, in red you see action potentials, so these individual blips, you, the cell is active. And if the animal, in, on the next day, you put the animal back in the same space, the cell would be active there. So the same would happen when I move from A to B, I have cells that are active in my hippocampus, and that map, so I have place cells for this spot, I have place cells for this spot, I have place cells for the other spot. And this cognitive map tells me where I am. Now the hippocampus, and that is most important, gets input from all the other sensory modalities. So from vision, from the motor system, and therefore whatever we memorize in episodic memory, or most what we memorize, takes place in a particular space. If you remember where you have heard a certain Schubert song, it was in that and that opera hall or concert hall, it is because we associate with that music a particular space. So in the hippocampus, the event that happens is associated with the space where it happens because the hippocampal formation gives you this particular spatial map. So that is important and that's why putting particular memories in a space helps us memorize it better. But our own body actually encodes our events in space because we are in that space and it is associated. So what I see today, what I hear today is associated with this particular space. And that is, of course, very, very, very important. If you remove the hippocampus, uh, this space, this, this map is gone. And the last technical slide, let me tell you very, very briefly. So here you would have an example, for instance, what happens if an animal runs in this particular environment. You have a place cell here in red. You see these are these ticks here. Each one is an action potential. The animal moves. The next cell is the blue cell. The cell is, or the, yeah, the, the blue cell. Immediately afterwards, the pink cell is active, and then the green cell. Now, something very, very, very important and you will find that in the Proust set, we encode space not exactly the way it is. If there is something important in that space, we associate that object with the space, and afterwards, in our sleep, there happens something that is called replay. The activity of the cells that have been active during waking they are repeated several times at a higher velocity. And those cells that have been active together during the wake period, their synapses strengthen during sleep. So the sleep is also there to consolidate these memories. Now, what is also important is that during sleep, those events that happen in this environment that are not important for the animal, they are not repeated that often or are not repeated at all. So what I want to convey to you, our memories are not a facsimile of our experiences. Our memories are chunks that are memorized that are important for us. So all of us will experience different things today and we will remember different things. And again, there was nobody who illustrated that as perfectly, I find, a hundred years ago, not knowing how memories function as Marcel Proust, who actually describes from the very first, from how perceptions happen to short-term memory, long-term memory, and how these long-term memories are actually, all our memories are actually placed in space and in a particular context. So um, I have now, uh, in, the, in the next part, I would like to go with you through these texts, but I have one more slide, and just for you in the text to recognize all the important parts that I have mentioned so far. So perception will be the first part, then short-term memory, long-term memory, and if I have time, I will also show you this context-dependent association. Now, the protagonist whom I'm going to talk to you about, Swan, has the whole 
piece of that he memorizes is a, is a short piece, a phrase of music. And we, in the first passage that I will read to you, you will see that it is just a very short phrase. He does not remember that whole sonata. He does not remember the whole andante. It is a particular preference that he has, maybe due to his education. He is not um, educated in, he is not educated in music. Swan is actually an art collector. He knows about paintings. So he is not really a musician or has this particular knowledge. Nevertheless, his taste makes it in some way that he likes this particular phrase. And you will see beautifully, he, he likes it because this phrase evokes very strong emotions. Now, another interesting point is, he, what I find very, very important is that this phrase evokes stimulating thoughts and thoughts that make Swan feel a different, they rejuvenate him. He, he feels young again, he feels creative again, and that is what the music does with him. And what I have shown you on this animation, how neurons talk to each other, you will see that this phrase comes back several times, and it's, it is this repetition that helps, so the repetitive stimulus that helps Swan to remember that. And finally, rethinking about this experience after he goes home, that is the process then where this rethinking helps the consolidation. So now let's go quickly through this text. And I have to read it slowly because, um, because Proust's sentences begin on one page and they end on the next page. So very, I highlighted those parts that I find particularly important. So on perception, just before we start, Proust does not expect this. He's at a soiree, he's invited. And he hears something that he has heard a year before. So this is the second time when Proust is exposed to this. So we read, the year before, at an evening party, he had heard a piece of music played on the piano and violin. At first, he had appreciated only the material quality of the sounds, which those instruments secreted, so something very material. And it had been a source of keen pleasure when, below the delicate line of the violin part, slender but robust, compact and commanding, he had suddenly become aware of the mass of the piano part beginning to emerge in a sort of liquid rippling of sound, multiform but indivisible, smooth yet restless, like the deep blue tumult of the sea, silvered and charmed into a minor key by the moonlight. But then, at a certain moment, without being able to distinguish any clear outline or to give a name to what was pleasing him, suddenly, enraptured, he had tried to grasp the phrase or harmony, he did not know which, that had just been played and that had opened and expanded his soul as the fragrance of certain roses wafted upon the moist air of evening has the power of dilating one's nostrils. Perhaps it was owing to his ignorance of music that he had received so confused an impression, one of those that are nonetheless the only purely musical impressions, limited in their extent, entirely original, and irreducible to any other kind. An impression of this order, vanishing in an instant, is, so to speak, sine materia. So it is the pure impression, it is an acoustic stimulus, it is something unexpected, no associations, no uh, comparisons with somebody, something, something else. And, but we see already, so Swan has not much of an experience in this field, and it, he is enraptured, it does something, and it is just this particular phrase that does it to him. And now we move on to the second part, which is very, very, very dense, because there we will see everything, what this music then triggers in Swan and what it does to him. So this is short-term memory. Let, before we le read the text, it is very, very important because while he listens to this music, and that's why he also will not remember everything, because he has already thoughts, and he wonders, how come that my memory can memorize something, or how, how happens that I can hear a whole tune if the next impression comes, and the next impression comes, and the next impression comes. And there is beautiful work for Goldmar Akic, who worked 
who worked with monkeys, showing that when a monkey holds something in memory, there are these cells that if you give the monkey a visual stimulus and the monkey has then to push a button, you have cells in the prefrontal cortex that are active during this time that the monkey keeps something in short-term memory. And Swan actually wonders, how happened, how come that if I begin a sentence, how come that when I come to the end of the sentence, you re I can have the whole phrase? It's because we have short-term memory that keep the beginning in mind till I have come to an end. That happens with music, that happens with language. So let's read the text together. But the notes themselves have vanished before these sensations have developed sufficiently to escape submersion under those which the succeeding or even simultaneous notes have already begun to awaken us. Did not our memory, like a laborer who toils at the laying down of firm foundations beneath the tumult of the waves, by fashioning for us a facsimile, of those fugitive phrases enable us to compare and to contrast them with those that follow. And so, scarcely had the exquisite sensation which Swan had experienced died away before his memory had furnished him with an immediate transcript, sketchy it is true and provisional, which he had been able to glance at while the piece continued, so that when the same impression suddenly returned, it was no longer impossible to grasp. He could picture, he could picture to himself its extent, its symmetrical arrangement, its notation, its expressive value. He had before him something that was no longer pure music, but rather design, architecture, thought, and which allowed the actual music to be recalled. This time he had distinguished quite clearly a phrase which emerged for a few moments above the waves of sound. It had at once suggested to him a world of inexpressible delights of whose existence before hearing it he had never dreamed, into which he felt that nothing else could initiate him. And he had been filled with love for it as with a new and strange desire. Then it vanished. He hoped with a passionate longing that he might find it again a third time. When he returned home, he felt the need of it. He was like a man into whose life a woman he has seen for a moment passing by has brought the image of a new beauty which deepens his own sensibility although he does not even know her name or whether he will ever see her again. So you have all the moments that we have heard of. You need this memory, the shorter memory, who keeps in shorter memory what has just passed. That helps him. Now, something very, very important, what Proust himself, in the same text, he corrects himself. He said, if our brain or our memory does not make a facsimile, a facsimile is an exact transcript of what has happened. But then he corrects himself. Our brain does not make a facsimile, as I had shown you with the place cells. Our brain actually removes parts that we are not interested in and that we are not emotionally touched by. So he corrects himself and says, actually, what Swan made, what his brain made, is a transcript. And that transcript, so since Swan is a very visual person, he's into arts, into paintings. So what does his brain do? His brain makes a design, an architecture, a thought. And it is this all together, the cognitive part, the emotional part, that helps him memorize this tune. I have one and a half minutes, and I go, and I go maybe then, I have a little more, okay, that's good to be lost. So I'm going through the next part that you will see. I want to want to, I left the sentences long to convey to you this beautiful language, but you can see wherever there are three points, I skipped whole parts because it would be too long. So what happens next? So now we move, actually it's a year later when this happens, when this happens again, that he goes, so he, he actually wanted to remember this, but then he forgot. So here we come, the long-term memory. Indeed, this passion for a phrase of music seemed for a time 
to open up before Swan the possibility of a sort of rejuvenation. This is still the second time, I'm sorry. But then it moves on. Swan found in himself, so this is what music does, in the memory of the phrase that he had heard, the presence of one of those invisible realities in which he had ceased to believe and to which, as though the music had, had opened the moral barrenness from which he was suffering, a sort of recreative influence, he was conscious once again of the desire and almost the strength to consecrate his life. Before we hear that Swan is into society, he has no more wishes, he has had it all, he has had lovers, he has money, he has, and he was disenchanted with everything. But this piece of music, it brings back, it makes him feel like the world still speaks to him. And this is what art does to him. But never having managed to find out whose work it was that he had heard played that evening, he had been unable to procure a copy and had finally forgotten the quest. And now the third time. But that night at Madame Verdurin's, Scarcely had the young pianist begun to play, Swan sensed its approach, so of the little phrase, and recognized secret, murmuring, detached, the airy and perfumed phrase that he had loved. And it was so peculiarly itself, it had so individual, so irreplaceable a charm, that Swan felt as though he had met in a friend's drawing room a woman whom he had seen and had admired in the street and had despaired of ever seeing her again. Finally, the phrase receded, diligently guiding its successors through the ramification of its fragrance, leaving on Swan's features the reflection of its smile, so of the, the smile of the phrase. But now, at last, he could ask the name of his fair unknown and was told that it was the Andante of Vettoi's Ventoi Sonata for piano and violin. And this is just, so we have it, the, the emotion, the recognition of that, the re-experiencing everything. And I really want, for the sake of time, not to read the fourth passage, but in the fourth passage, we learn actually something else very important. On that evening, he sits next to Odette. Odette is a fine courtesan, and it is, this little andante, this little phrase, becomes the hymn of their love. So Swan, in this context, loving this woman, he also feels that the people around are charming. He feels that this woman, who actually does not fit to him at all, is charming and falls in love with her. And so we see all the different parts that we have heard of see the reward of recognizing something. We see the strong emotion, what it did to him, this rejuvenation process. And we experience, for lack of time, I cannot show this to you, but Marcel himself, the writer, experiences many volumes later something very similar. He also hears this peculiar andante. And now what is very interesting is the juxtaposition of these two protagonists. One hears just a sonata, and they both have synesthetic pleasures. And that is, by the way, a very important theme, the synesthesia. You know, we see in Swan, he has other associations. And in that second part, uh, Proust calls the sonata white and associates it with a particular, and the, the, the septet, because the, the composer developed this music in an ample piece of music towards the end of his life. And we find an appeal to creativity ourselves. So the writer is also just frequenting saloons, high society, and has no real great interest in life anymore. And listening to the septet of Ventoy, Marcel Proust comes to the decision that creativity and generating something as immortal as art is the only value you can obtain in life. And that's where actually the recherche then begins. So, and he, he, he brings up figures of angels of Bellini and of Mantegna, and he has all these different associations, so images that are very, very, very clear, and that one type of music is white, the other type of music is red, because it's not two instruments anymore, but it is seven instruments. And in both protagonists, it evokes 
keen interests in ideal values and in finding a path to one's own uniqueness, to one's own immortality, as we have heard from Rita Liva, Rita Liva Montalcini, immortal means what do we leave behind and not this, this body. So I have hoped, actually, I was so glad to hear the other speakers alluding on many of these fragments, the reward system, the, the uh, memory system per se, but here we have it, have it all, and we even have your particular interest, dance, because Proust writes in a different passage about our body memory. So the protagonist walks in rainy, Paris and he slips on a cobblestone and that brings up an image a body movement he basically loses his equilibrium and that brings him back to the Piazza San Marco in Venice because there he slipped and his body made the same movement so also there you have a body memory for things and that is illustrated so Proust 100 years ago not knowing any of these mechanisms has just laid them down for us in this most marvelous and it's beautiful in this very very moving uh, language. And with that, I close my talk and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Beautiful talk. Thank you very much indeed. Really, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. So I guess I went over time. So no, no. I think we, are, we have done uh, well, everyone. So you had, uh, uh, I think. Questions? Pietro. Thank you, and uh, congratulations. Excellent, wonderful talk. Um, I have a general question that uh, just a, a comment. We have been uh, heard, hearing uh, the, the entire um, uh, Saturday, the moment, the mechanism of uh, memories and the formation of memories and so forth. But uh, what about forgiving? The mechanism of forgiving, if, if, you, think, if you consider a cell, it, it's, all, it's always uh, uh, um, synthesizing something, but it has to destroy something. And I think it's uh, extremely important. So are you asking about forgetting? Exactly. About, about the other goddess yes. later? So that is a very important question. But this, well, I, I had a few slides. So in animal models, forgetting is not studied so well. But um, there are a few other um, uh, uh, models that are very well. So forgetting there are two big essential theories. And they both go back to some important German scientists 100 years ago. So one, if you Google when you go home and give in Ebbinghaus, you will see the forgetting curve. So Ebbinghaus, um, in, at the end of the 19th century, generated this forgetting curve, showing very clearly that in about five weeks, if you've learned something by heart and you don't come back to that, and if it is not unique, if it does not have images, 80% is forgotten. And in fact, forgetting, we are not talking about the pathological forgetting, but the physiological forgetting is something very, very important. You don't need to know where you've parked your car yesterday. That's not important. So it is very, very important. Also, traumatic events, it's important to forget certain things and it is over, overridden. The other, so this theory is the decay theory, and I'm sure that, that, that there is a part to that. But then there is something else, and that is very important for our modern world, um, and that is the interference theory. And that was actually also by two Germans, 1900, proposed that if we experience something, lots of experimental work, so psychology in humans, saying that once you experience something, this very moment, if something else happens shortly after that, and we're talking the first five and 10 minutes, it interferes with what we have heard from Christina with the consolidation of the memory that you've built before. And so this interference theory also produces forgetting. But also that, now that is very important because in our modern world, we incessantly do things at the same time and run from one appointment to the next. So I'm very much interested in that. Um, in, the, in the mouse, in, in the most models, it's not experienced, but it is in the Rosophila land fly and in sea elegant in the warm, the mechanism, the molecular mechanism, these animals also, animals, these creatures, they also forget. So forgetting is absolutely essential um, and it's a counterpart 
In, uh, in the C. elegans and in Drosophila, in the Drosophila is the dopamine system that plays a role. So there, it is, um, okay. it's not the and same pathway. The it's not as okay. if you have one um, molecular pathway and it goes backwards. It's different pathways, one leading to learning and the other one leading to forgetting. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. I'd like to...